Hello and welcome to another IBM Developer Meetup for Australia and New Zealand. Thanks for geeking out with us. Be sure to like and subscribe to get the latest updates, news, events and more. Hello everyone and thank you all for joining us for this super special IBM Developer Meetup for November. Really excited to have everyone here. Um, before we get underway, I'd like to begin by acknowledging and paying my respects to the traditional owners on the lands on which we meet today with a special heartfelt respect and acknowledgement to the Wadarung people who are the traditional owners right here in Ballarat, where I come to you from today. I'd also like to pay my respects and acknowledgements to the Indigenous elders past and present. And so, yeah, thank you all. I'm also joined here, for those that don't know me, hello, developer Steve, and I'm also joined here by my colleague and amazing, awesome person, developer <laughs> Ali. Hello, Ali. Hi, everyone, and thank you for that intro, and uh, welcome to country, Steve. Really appreciate that. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining us here for our awesome block party special. Um, tonight, Ooh. we've got uh, four amazing speakers and three amazing talks, so really looking forward to that. Uh, because we've got three speakers, I'm going to jump right into it, basically. So... Uh, We've got an opening from the awesome Iwan Winoto, uh, Harris Monis joining us, innovator extraordinaire. Um, our research lab um, blockchain specialist, Alison and Nick. Um, and we've also got research specialist, Ermias, uh, joining us for the third speech. Um, so feel free to ask questions uh, anytime during these uh, talks, guys. Um, and I'm sure the speakers will get to them. If they don't, we'll ask them at the end. Um, so feel free to ask any questions in the chat there. Um, we'll also the, have network. Sorry, go ahead, Steve. <laughs> or the Q and A section. And hot tip: if you want to make those questions look even more special in the general chat, you can use HTML tags. Just said. Yep the the uh, ultra special marquee tag question. Hey, looking forward <laughs> yeah, to that. I love so marquee. <laughs> It is. It's pretty fun. Uh, just a quick breakdown on how the venue works. We know this is a little bit different to maybe your Zoom or WebEx chats. Um, so we're trying to make it a little bit fun on Workshop Island here, a little bit of a holiday away from home maybe. <laughs> um, but the venue uh, basically works. You can chat by turning your mic or camera on in the bottom menu. If you have any issues where you kind of can't talk, try jumping to another table, which is just you click another table um, and it'll jump you to it. Um, and then back again, usually it'll, if there's a bit of a glitch, it'll fix it. Um, you can also change view by clicking on tile view or back to floor view. You won't be able to do that in presenter mode, so um, that won't work now, but afterwards in the networking section, it will. Um, and yeah, use the Q&A tab, as Steve mentioned, to ask questions of the speakers and you can vote them up and down as well. And you can text chat um, in the general chat as well using those uh, uh, whatever tags you want, really. Let's Ooh, see who can get their HTML flare out. <laughs> <laughs> um, so by being here, obviously, you're by my account of contact, conduct, uh, inclusive, diverse, respectful, and friendly, as I'm sure you all are. So basically, be excellent to each other. Um, and I love this meme. <laughs> <laughs> I had to put it in when I found it. Just it's another linked list with extra steps. Um, I think Ewan might tell us that that is not true. So um, a big welcome to Ewan. He's the Chief Architect of Blockchain Practice at IBM Australia and New Zealand, over 25 years in the IT industry. Um, and I know he is going to give us a great intro uh, to tonight's event. So I'd like to welcome you to the stage, uh, Ewan. Thanks, Ali. Thanks, Steve. Hello. Uh, so yes, thank you. It's um, good evening to everybody. It's, it's it's great to be here with you tonight at the uh, at the blockchain meetup. Uh, first time I've done it like this in this uh, in this forum, so it's pretty pretty exciting. Um, and and I'm going to say I'm really honoured to be opening uh, tonight for these uh, fantastic speakers that we've got here tonight to uh, to talk with you about uh, about our blockchain uh, blockchain work. Um, you know, this, I'm just the architect. These are the guys that really make everything work for, for our customers and, and get our solutions delivered and, and deployed and working. Um, now, just to, uh, just to uh, start with, some of you may know, you may have gotten, if you're, if you're following Hyperledger, you may know that uh, in December this year, it's going to be five years since the launch of the Hyperledger project. So it's turning five years old this December. Um, and if you go uh, to the hyperledger.org 
show you, uh, you'll see that uh, there's, um, there's uh, where we go, application window. Oh, I've lost my thing now. Okay, hang on a second. Sorry, sorry. Oh, there it is. Yep. Um, there's uh, there's some there's a, some great events coming up from the Hyperledger project to celebrate their five year anniversary, uh, and there's a whole bunch of talks about. Uh, so they're going to be grading the first five years and really having a good critical look at at um, uh, at how five years of Hyperledger has gone on. Um, and uh, examining the role of, of blockchain in, uh, in transforming business. Uh, so there's some great, great events over there. If you want to join, those are going to be happening over the next five weeks, starting, uh, when is it, starting next weekend, I think. Yeah, December the se November the 17th. Um, so if you want to have a look at that, go to the hyperleisure.org website and then click on uh, news events and announcements and you'll, and you'll find it all listed over there. I um, hope you all get a chance to to do that. I think it's really going to be worth it. Uh, but for tonight, you know, we're going to be talking about um, all the things that that, uh, that IBM's been doing. Uh, but you'll know that um, you know these uh, over the five years of of Hyperledger, uh, a lot has happened in that five years. And uh, from the first project, which was Hyperledger Fabric, which was uh, donated to the Linux Foundation by by IBM uh, as an open source project, uh, which you know was providing a high performance uh, blockchain network. Since then, there's been some 14 or so other blockchain projects under the Hyperledger banner that have been contributed to the community by by various industry partners and uh, another um, another community open source developers as well. So it's ex absolutely extremely vibrant project and um, uh, foundation to be involved to be involved with um, so all sorts of things so obviously from fabric to sawtooth which is um, separating network applications and allowing you to build business rules and Indy, uh, which is one of the technologies i'm really excited about which is building permissionless networks for uh, verifiable credentials um, and uh, and uh, backed by uh, the sovereign network who basically run a, a uh, public verifiable credential network that uh, that runs globally and ibm's uh, one of the partners and runs one of the nodes on that uh so other other technologies other projects like burrow uh, which is doing permissioned ethereum nodes and besu for uh, ethereum clients all sorts of projects like that and even other other tools and libraries as well to help with building uh to help with building blockchain applications and and making the management and testing and, and performance uh, benchmarking of blockchain app, um, uh, projects and applications easier. So obviously, it's it's a it's a fast growing project, and it's it's run by a really vibrant community. So you'll see things constantly coming on. So sometimes things will get deprecated. So so projects like Composer, which was um, another one of IBM's projects to uh, to help build smart contracts. Uh, that that's been deprecated and really because the rest of the hyperledger fabric has really matured so there wasn't seen as a need to have composer anymore um, so altogether you know it's it's a it's a fantastic community to be involved with and we're really excited about being part of this and all the different projects that are going on obviously uh, with a lot of the projects that you you'll be hearing about today uh, our main focus has been on fabric um, you know, which provides a, uh, a shared and replicated permissioned um, ledger for, for our businesses and our enterprises to work with. Um, uh, but, you know, that's, that doesn't mean that we don't work with uh, other, other blockchain technologies and protocols. Uh, and, and one of the uh, interesting ones that we're working on as well is, is the, obviously, Indy uh, is one that we're working on. And another one is also uh to um to provide blockchain interoperability between different networks and different networks of different uh different protocols as well as we're seeing this uh as we're seeing this growth of blockchain in the acceptance and maturity of of businesses in uh in their uh, adoption of blockchain we're really seeing the need for uh, uh for networks to to come together and uh, uh and create new platforms out of out of different uh, out of different networks um, 
And so that's really a lot of the things that we've seen, especially in Australia as well, um, as businesses understanding of, of, uh, of blockchain and adoption of blockchain is maturing. So we're no longer talking about proof of concept projects. And you'll see that a lot to, today in, in, the, in the discussions that are coming up. Um, but instead, you know, more and more of our customers and other businesses are, are, are seeing blockchain as, as one of the key technologies to, to their business success. Uh, and it's allowing them to look at uh, their existing business networks in new ways and, and develop new networks as well and finding new opportunities. So we're seeing new platforms being developed. And that's you know, one of the big ones that I'm working on at the moment, which I think Harris is going to be talking about, uh, the um, Ligon blockchain uh, platform for, for bank guarantees. And that's really becoming a, uh, a platform between different banks to, uh, to provide bank guarantees to uh, uh, to commercial property holders. Uh, and so we're really seeing this, this uh, maturity and evolution of, of, uh, of the business networks to, to expand outside of, uh, of, their, uh, of their siloed walls and, and create new platforms. Uh, and so as I mentioned before, you know, when we talk about these, uh, there's, these, these platforms that are building up, but what we're seeing as the next phase also is, uh, is starting to integrate disparate um, business platforms and starting to integrate different uh, uh, ledger, ledger um, implementations and technologies to, through interoperability and also through trusted credentials uh, so that you can establish trust between different networks uh, that, are, that are based on blockchain. And so that's a lot of the things that, that, uh, that we're starting to work on as well and that we're seeing interest from, from our customers on as well. So I think, you know, if you, if you think back uh, to the formation of the internet, you know, everybody accepts that the internet is there and, and, it's, and it's a core part of, of, uh, of, of running a, a business and, and a lot of our lives as well. And I think we're getting fast to that point where blockchain is going to be a, a part of that as well. Um, and, uh, and it'll be an integral part of, of how, we, how we transact. Um, so... With that, I just want to uh, you know, use that as our opening remarks, and uh, I want to pass it now on to to Harris, uh, and uh, he's probably one of uh, you know he's he's one of the key speakers who's who's been involved in a lot of our um, in a lot of our uh, uh, business network developments, uh, and and has had some great success in in uh, in developing and building those with our with our customers and, and looking at the innovations that they that they can achieve. Uh, so I'll pass it on to you. Thank you. Amazing. Thank you. Um, and yet we have, we're, we're really fortunate to be joined with Harris uh, here today who knows a lot about blockchain. And I say that because we've been working on some pretty cool stuff together and just hearing some of the stories that he's probably going to tell tonight, or at least just the, the, the tales that he's going to tell tonight uh, is going to be amazing. So without further ado, Harris. Awesome. Thanks, everyone, for the brilliant introduction. Um, hi, again. Um, my name's Harris. I'll be bringing something up on the screen to present right about now. And I'll provide a little bit of a background on myself because I, I come from a, a side of blockchain which isn't actively explored on where a lot of these uh, things that you'll be hearing tonight about interoperability and Haskell 
um, come from the highly technology sides where where IBM falls and it's the common perception of IBM as, as a business. Um, but just actively importantly and actively and, and quite important is the element that a lot of our developers also bring into, which is the business side. Um, today, you'll be hearing a framework that we call blockchain network design being brought up. I'll be talking about the Ligon concept, which Ewan was, uh, which Ewan briefly mentioned before, which we have uh, been operating here within Australia uh, and New Zealand. And then we'll finish up on a on a high level um, of how these two pieces merge together. So, so to open up, uh, I wanted to frame up exactly how IBM blockchain uh, works. And uh, one side of this is the side that Ewan and I operate within, which is the services side. And we also have the research side, which you'll hear two of our speakers today chat about um, uh, from the uh, Haskell and interoperability side. Where IBM Services sits into, and where where we fall into, is a is a three tiered you know hamburger stack. We develop these ecosystem partnerships, we create solutions, and we develop on platforms. Now, when we collaborate with our partners that develop these solutions, where the highly skilled outcomes and where we are able to create highly efficient industry platforms like the Ligon one that you'll hear today is when we bring together a notion of a holistic solution. It's not just the platform and it's not just solving a challenge. It's also building this ecosystem and the ability for, you know, myself, the team, Ewan, you'll hear Alison and Nick and Ermius as well, is that when, we're, when solving these issues using a framework like blockchain network design that you'll hear about is where we encapsulate how we can build up a entire brand new ecosystem and industry platform with a solution that really solves these critical industry challenges that clients, participants, people are coming up to that are wanting to solve and they need to bring in other people uh, to solve this solution. So when we talk about IBM blockchain, really there are these three key outcomes that we highlight. And a more up-to-date view when you think about, you know, consensus and provenance and, and shared visibility is that at the end of the day, uh, quite often there is a document digitization process that exists. Uh, you'll hear about it quite significantly in the Ligon framework uh, later on in the chat. But I want everyone to make sure that when you think about and hear these solutions that are being brought up, uh, or the solution that I'll be talking about today, is that there were three main issues in this process. There, there were paper-based documents, there was very inconsistent visibility that can occur, and there was a need to ensure that this data when entered into a brand new platform is trusted and, support and supported. Now, when industries, ecosystems, enterprises, companies come together, there's a choice that often occurs. And the choice that, that, that may lie there is between a permissioned and permissionless blockchain system. I'm not gonna go into the details about you know, the, the, the differences between the two, uh, but the easiest way to think about it is it's closed and open, right? A permissioned is you'll ask for access to it or you'll be granted it. Uh, permissionless is anyone's able to enter the ecosystem. Now, the, the question that would immediately arise is when you think about blockchain, it's decentralized, it's a brand new type of democratic uh, authority, or, or authority that can provide the ability for different parties that may not trust each other to interact in a brand new system. And uh, we had that funny meme that Ali, you brought up before with linked databases. And you go, well, yeah, why can't we use something like that? And, and where this falls into is to, well, enterprise could have chosen something like that. Why choose a permission blockchain? And this really falls into these four uh, niche subcategories that changes and, and can reperceive the perception of why a blockchain and why a permission blockchain. They fall into shared trusted data across multiple parties. Multiple parties need to interact within this system where they each have value in finding out what the end assets would exist. So that's that transferring of asset between parties. There is a need for privacy in this network. Why not choose permissionless uh, rather than permission? Because we need an, a form of privacy, but we also need to flip privacy on its head. 
privacy in the notion of not knowing who I am, but also privacy in the notion that we need to know who is in this network as well. There needs to be a greater trust. I need to trust when businesses or a person is interacting with me rather than a pseudonym or a, or, or a, um, or a hash that would represent uh, who they are within this network or their, or their public key. So going into these challenges, what we used to ask um, before we moved into this blockchain network design framework uh, existed around 10 key questions. Now, these questions were brought up because they were aiming to digest and have these different you know, technologists and business solution chaps and ecosystem chaps all work together and huddle in a room and we would all try and think about, you know, what, how can this be molded into a potential solution? And what really came out of this is that when forming these solutions, the technology piece is quite often the easiest piece that comes out of it. Where the hardest parts of solving the blockchain puzzle lay within is who is involved in this and what are their end roles? When we talk about business network participants and we talk about the organizations that are involved in brand new ecosystems, really, what is the heart of that role? Are we talking about in the form of a bank guarantee, a bank, or are we talking about an issuer, which is a bit more broadly encapsulating? Are we talking about specific people within this or uh, are we changing jobs that they may have? What are the transactions that we begin moving around and what are the assets that need to be associated with these transactions before we can really create a network and a technology wrapper that solves some of these challenges? So IBM took a large amount of learnings um, and, and a large amount of people power to design what we call blockchain network design, funnily enough. Uh, now, blockchain network design aims to take learnings from I, th I think it's nearly a thousand plus different blockchain engagements that we've had and summate them into a framework which is much more easily palatable, expandable, and, and can actually take this and, and, and frame it up and package it up into a neat re-replicable solution essentially, where different people, regardless of their background, um, whether or not you're highly into the developer sphere highly into the governance sphere or highly into the business sphere can take take different solutions and ensure that when you're developing out your solution all the way to the end of you know a POC all the way to a productionized platform that we are ticking all the boxes and making sure that we're not leaving things behind so to start off with um, the the wrapper that we begin with is defining what type of network we want to start off with um, now, this first step would be often, you know, we think about the technology or the problem that we want to solve and really it's flipping it on its head. There's quite often the ability of solving a problem, but then not having anyone to use it. I'm sure that we've all developed, you know, and left in, in GitHub some random project that we thought was groundbreaking and revolutionary, but there's no people to actually operate it. Now, people is the power here in blockchain systems, in regular processes, uh, but especially in these distributed networks that we create, people is power. Now, we need some type of organization, multiple different people or brand new markets that would exist to take this up and scale it up to the point where it becomes self-sustaining. So these three buckets exist. There are founder networks, there are industry networks, and there are new market models. Founder networks, think of large businesses that exist. Uh, the greatest example, if you know many of the IBM blockchain projects that exist, a founder network would be an example of IBM Food Trust with Walmart or Trade Lens with Merce, where these large organizations that have such a large amount of clout in the industry that they can begin to pull different levers to get different people to join their own project that they're existing. You are collaborating with non-competitors competitors in this example, Food Trust, Walmart, having your avocado farmers come in, you know, build it up all the way and say, no, this is the new supply chain that we're going to be using. You need to use food trust. Industry networks. This is when Ligon would come into an example into this. They're shared market utilities for industry networks. It's an industry problem that may exist. We want to collaborate with competitors, the banks all collaborating in a single process 
to optimize this shared process that exists. In Ligon, that fundamentally was a bank guarantee, which we'll go into a bit more in depth later on. But I want you all to at least assume that when we're running through this, you realize how much of an industry network we're talking about Ligon and where it falls into this. Now, new market models are, are the real juicy stuff, right? A new market is a brand new marketplace across an entire ecosystem, and it bridges these industry networks together. It reinvents how non-traditional partners can begin to facilitate and work together um, in building new value props, platforms, and marketplaces. You'll hear a little bit later on as we talk about interoperability um, in that facet. Now, I want everyone to make sure that when you think about new market models, the examples may not be, you know, right smack bang in the middle of your face. It may be microcredit micro credit that would be passed on to purchasing a car that you need to then insure afterwards. And these are all different types of ecosystems that exist as to buying a car and then insuring it afterwards. They're two different ones, but you can see that that Venn diagram does, you know, collapse in on each other a little bit. And there is that niche little spot where a new market model can sit. Now, uh, talking about a blockchain network that scales, we've dropped on a few points of uh, leading together some major principles once you have once you have a general idea of where your different blockchain sits within this, if it's a founder network, industry, or new market. Where IBM has uh, placed its research in design-based principles is to ensure that you move forward throughout your initiative in a facet that hits all the good boxes and ticks everything that you need to ensure that a solution is able to scale in a, in a very successful manner moving forward. Now, what we call this is blockchain network design. It focuses on these three pillars that you see in the center of your screen there, governance design, technology design, and business value design. I'll, I'll go through them in a little bit more depth and I'm unable to see any questions, but I'm assuming you, everyone will pipe up eventually with some questions if there aren't. But governance design, it, it ensures that there is a model that exists where every member within this will receive benefits in a fair and democratic way. It, by fair and democratic, we are not having single businesses having full control and power of the network and where it goes and what operates and who operates within it. The voting process of the next phase, for example, comes into governance to ensure that it's successful in shipping between different geographies, for example. That's the governance layer. And it's quite key in ensuring that it isn't forgotten behind because technology, as a lot of us know, is the easiest part. It's quite easy to develop a blockchain. It's quite difficult to scale that outwards. Now, the human winning experience that, um, that I've written there isn't to do with, you know, the actual ledger itself that, 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 is, that you can fundamentally develop. Uh, Nick and Alison will be talking about Haskell uh, and ensuring uh, from, from that point of the ledger side. But when we think about technology design, it's actually quite, it's quite encapsulating. Uh, large scale projects, food trust, Ligon, trade lens, aren't just a ledger at the end of the day. They are a UI that exists there. There is a middleware that exists where different players need to integrate integrate into the system to provide different data to the ledger and, and, for, and for that ledger to be the middleman between multiple different networks. Uh, privacy, how do you deploy it? The technology design is much larger than just the blockchain that exists but rather everything else that you need to stack on top of the ledger to ensure that it becomes an enterprise grade solution. And finally, we land on business value design. The business value design is the reason why enterprises, organizations, people will want to join your network. Why is it, are, are you solving a challenge? Are you making everyone's life easier? Is there, a, is there a reason to collaborate in this? And a lot of the time the question is, Am I going to find some type of return? Now, the, the notion of as developers within today isn't to fundamentally quantify that, but it's to qualify that, to say, hey, I know that me solving this problem will result in someone's life being easier at the end of the day. And that will result in a type of saving. I think it's you know high-ish, but there is a reason for me to continue down this path. And that is something that quite often 
um, may be forgotten at times because the, you are solving it. You are really in depth into the technology. It's something that I've personally noticed as well of liking the cool tech that underlies a lot of these solutions and not focusing on the end user. So the frame around that creates this blockchain network. Now, shipping both those, all, all that aside, we know we've got some networks. Which one are we going to pick? How are we going to scale that outwards? There are four key phases of your POC all the way to production. Uh, and these are categorized in, this, in, in these explore, envision, establish, and evolve. Um, when we talk about exploring, that's when we decide that network that we talked about a couple of slides back. Who's going to join it? Are we going to join something else? Do we want to merge networks? Are we extending it? Or are we just creating our own thing and then going, hey, let's use some of the cool stuff that's coming out of IBM Research with interoperability and begin to connect these two networks later on. There is a business opportunity identified. We know we're going to save time for someone's life at the end of the day. Um, and we know who is going to join this or who we want to join this. We go into Envision. Then we get into a bit more of the complex areas where Envision and Establish, we're really focusing on a business case. The technology is a big tick. We know that there's something there. We can build it. How do we ensure that we get investors, people, businesses involved to say, hey, we want to use your solution or people saying, we want to use your solution because it's going to make my life a lot easier at the end of the day. Indie network, when we talk about decentralized identity, um, we talk about allowing citizens uh, the ability to express who they are, uh, a credential of themselves, how, how they are a citizen of Australia or the world in a manner that is, is up to them and to choose that manner uh, through different verifiable proofs as part of as part of indie or sovereign. We know that there is a business case there to say that this this can significantly improve the lives of people, but there is a different facet when you flip it now on its head. The example that I just brought up, when you think about some of the things I've been talking about of, of extending your thought process over, how great are these you know, identity cases for a HR department? Very valuable in that circumstance. Going down, commercials, integrated technology platforms, yep, we know that there is going to be some type of integration into some back-end systems. The final key part of saying that you are a tick-the-box, fully established entity is when you go into this evolve stage. Uh, a fully established productionized system where you have a governing body that runs the platform, uh, that takes the decisions of where the network is moving towards and you have an enhanced platform which can run run real transactions and generate real returns is when you can fully move through this all the way and say that you are a productionized system and now you have the steps and the backbone uh, to take yourself through all those different processes of governance, business value, and technology. The example that I've been alluding to for a while now is Ligon. Now, where Ligon came out from is, is a is a, a consortium that's been developed and established by five key players within the market. Uh, ANZ, Bank, Commonwealth Bank, uh, IBM, Center Group, and Westfield. And if you don't know Center Group, they are the owners and operators of the Westfield shopping centers here within uh, Australia. Uh, now, Ligon is, aims at solving a very niche and dark corner of finance. Ligon aims to solve a, a platform or a process called a bank guarantee. Now, a bank guarantee is, is an is a irrefutable claim by a, a beneficiary within the ecosystem uh, when you have not completed a core part of your contract. Think about if you fall behind on rent, for example. A bank guarantee, which you take out as, a, as an applicant, so you're renting a shop, you're an applicant, you apply to a bank or an issuer, and you say, hey, bank, uh, please validate me. And if I fall behind on my rent, I allow Center Group, a beneficiary in this circumstance, to withdraw against that amount. Now, they can make a claim against this. Bank guarantees are especially suited to blockchain systems where there is a valid end result that exists and there is irrefutable claims that need to exist. Funnily enough, they are also, or historically were at least, one of the very few pieces of financial instruments that were on paper. You would literally go to an issuer, a bank uh, quite often in that circumstance, you'd say, hey, I want a bank guarantee. 
and they would go through the application process and hand you a paper document, which then you would then have to hand deliver to a organization like Center Group, which would hold it in this really large vault of all these different bank guarantees that they'd have from all their different shops. Now, for me, when I was hearing about this a couple of years back, I was absolutely perplexed as to how that ever would have existed, how we still have paper that is a fundamental um, you know, financial instrument that is not digitized at all. But you know, there we were, and here we are today, a, fu a fully digitized process. Now, if we go back to what I was saying historically, when we talked about the network itself, now, uh, E1 mentioned Ligon and Fabric. Uh, where I'm looking at this from is to ensure that the people and the processes that, that create Ligon as an entity that exists uh, is solving a fundamental issue. And as anyone that works in this space would tell you, it's that solving a fundamental issue is core to not only the success of the business, but ensure the success and uptake of that platform as well. So there are people and there are processes. The people involved, three parties, core, and all have a valid interest and valid interest in ensuring the success of that instrument. Applicants, you're a tenant, you're renting out a shop, beneficiaries, you're a landlord and you want to get bank guarantee to ensure that you know, you, you're know you still going to receive rent from that shop and issuers who are the middleman and provide that guarantee uh, as on behalf of the applicant to the beneficiary. Where Ligon comes into is a really simple process solving issue. We spoke about paperwork, crazy, I know, paperwork in, in this. Digital first now, fully digitized process that exists. A standardized of key standardization of key industry processes. When bank guarantees existed historically between the three parties that you saw there, they are all generally the same. However, wording variations can exist. Uh, different, different ways that they're represented on a single form can exist. A whole myriad of uh, different ways that you can describe a bank guarantee, which you know can be applied to a lot of these contractual stuff that, that exists out there within financial instruments, where blockchain provides a highly specialized method of ensuring that industry processes across the large network of participants is successful, is that we can standardize that quite easily. The, the smart contracts that exist at the underlying, uh, underlying the ledger itself that need to be executed upon by these three people on the left-hand side can be standardized to a form and the ability to ensure that when they are executed, that they are truthful and the inputs that are provided are truthful and we can trust this new digital instrument. Now, when we talk about trust, that falls us into this final category of increasing visibility in the process that underlies this. Blockchain as a, as a provenance engine that, that exists is, is highly suited to uh, process and visibility. Uh, Ali spoke about uh, linking databases. Blockchain is a distribution of those databases now towards every one of these players within the network. You can ensure that applicants, beneficiaries, issuers, you can ensure that the end result and that guarantee is in its final state and everyone has full visibility of that uh, in, a, in the modern society that should exist. Think about the paperwork question that existed then. How can you ensure that uh, that piece of paper is always up to date? What if there's a date that in, would expire, in which it expires and the landlord and you know, centre group doesn't see that? that? That guarantee now is worthless to them and they've got someone renting out a shop or the applicant itself, they may not know what stage it is at the issuer side. Full visibility up and down the line for all players within the ecosystem. Now you would have noticed that what I'm highlighting here is that we are talking about one digital platform that exists. One digital platform for these three participants, issuers, beneficiaries, and applicants. Now this value prop and the value prop behind us solving this with Fabric, with a myriad of other technologies that sit upon this to make it enterprise and bank grade, is that we are stepped inside the user's shoes. Why would an issuer want to digitize these? Well, they want to increase productivity. They want to reduce their cost in dispute resolutions and guarantee reviews. They want to uplift their customer's experience. This is the applicant's experience when they want to quick turnaround. 
for an applicant, we'll go right down to the bottom there because we're talking about quick turnarounds. A digitized blockchain-based solution reduces this from a month to a day. That is crazy benefits off a platform which is distributed um, ac across, across these different players. You reduce that risk of losing or damaging it. The paper is gone out of this. And you improve that visibility uh, of, of guarantee status, life cycle changes, and you alleviate all costs of storage for beneficiaries uh, and the ability for them to just and potential disputes which may come out of it. So where IBM took this entire ethos, which I would call it for a better use of a term, because I, I would be putting it as an ethos for everyone that works within IBM blockchain, is that we take this step, step backwards and not think about the technology that underlies it, but rather what are we solving for these different businesses? You can see a, a list of just a few different businesses and organizations that we've worked with. The bank guarantees on the left. We talked, spoke about food trust there on the, on the middle left-hand corner. What we fundamentally look at is ensuring that there are multiple players operating within a single ecosystem which may or may not trust each other. Now, providing that framework of ensuring that we are solving a business challenge, we have technology that can solve that challenge, and we have an appropriate governance layer where these different parties are beginning to agree on what they want that future state to be is how we define blockchain network design. So I hope you had a, a, a great um, a session with myself. I had a bunch of fun talking about this. It's really groundbreaking approach to thinking about how you can design uh, your solutions in the future. And uh, thank you all for, for listening today. That was amazing. Thank you. As usual, like I know we've done a few projects together now and yeah, always love hearing you talk all about the blockchain things. Um, we do have a couple of questions. We do. Um, Ali, do you want to oh, sure. uh, ask the first one? Uh, there was one question here from Josh Wolf who wants to know, blockchain seems good for immutable state and proof, but is it orthogonal to privacy? Um, and I think related end-to-end -end encryption and anonymity, it's a hard word to say, uh, are they a bad fit for blockchain and vice versa? Yeah, I don't think in, in regards to, so let's take, like, take that privacy as a whole encapsulating question. Um, when we talk about privacy as a whole, um, there, there, are, there are different reasons that may exist at the end of the day for the need for privacy. Now, quite often when I think of privacy, and that this was Josh, so quite often when I think of privacy, Josh, I think of is there a need for people to, to um, show who they are in this? And that, that is the people sense. Um, I've got a whole vast thing where we can talk about GDPR and um, PII and SPI and, and business sensitive information, so, you know, personal sensitive information, um, personally identifiable information and business sensitive information, um, how you can, from a technology point of view, ensure that all these requirements are met is that you have the ability to store some of this, you know, highly sensitive uh, personal identifiable information in these things called off-chain databases and then take the hash of that database and hold that on the ledger. So you can literally have the best of both worlds where you can have the, the provenance piece where you can ensure that if there is a change, it's stored on the ledger but also have the ability that you have, you can ensure that when um, data needs to be deleted, so you know personal information needs to be deleted, it can be in a safe, secure manner. So uh, I wouldn't call them, you know, as disparate. Um, they can actually work with each other as to ensure that you do meet the requirements at the end of the day. Um, I I know you got to run an amazing talk, but I do have one more question. Do you know who Santoshi is? No, we won't answer that today. We'll keep everyone in touch. Oh, I think I'm cutting out. I think I'm cutting out. <laughs> did you hear who I said? Um, I, 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 I kind of did, but no, it's, it's fine. It was amazing. It's Thank you secret. very much. I think there is, sorry, Steve, there's just one last question as well from Reno in the chat there. How and where do you store big file, e.g. video, in private permissioned blockchain? Is it like IPFS on private nodes? So it would depend on the type. If you're talking about, um, you know, like JPEGs, videos and stuff, you could, they're on some type of object storage that would sit outside that. And exactly the same as when we're talking about personal data just before, uh, take the hash of that on the ledger um, in, instead. It'd be really consequential to the performance of the, of the ledger if you're storing that on there and then making consistent changes to it. 
Um, so uh, happy to share that uh, when if at a later date. But yeah, that, that's the type of facet that I'd be envisaging when you're talking about videos and you know images and JPEGs and stuff like that. Amazing. Okay. Yeah, amazing. Thank you so much for your time, Harris. Um, you guys can uh, look up Harris on LinkedIn or, or chat with us if you want to get in touch with him as well. Um, thanks again, Harris. Appreciate it. I know you're running off to a conference call now, so um, we'll see you soon. Uh, thanks for joining us from the UK as well, Matt. Some good discussion going on in the chat here. Um, I want to, because we're a little short on time, guys, I want to welcome up our next amazing research blockchain researchers. Um, Alison Irvin and Nick Waywood. Um, so Alison and Nick both work in IBM Research Australia as well. Um, and I know they're super, super passionate about Haskell. So I am not going to say too much about that. I'm going to let them talk for themselves. Thank you, uh, Alison and Nick. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Um, I will just share my screen. Um, this one here. Mm -hmm. Yep. How that, do should, you... that should do it. Oh, I know this one there. Oh, thank you. All right. Um, yeah, so as Alison mentioned, I'm Alison. This is Nick. Um, we're software engineers at IBM Research Australia. Um, our team, we're in the blockchain team, and we do a few things. We work on client projects with GBS, which is like the business arm of IBM, which is where Harris works. Um, so we, we do things like help out with the de design and development of client projects like Ligon. Um, and we also do some more long-term research into where we think blockchain is heading in the future. So um, Ermias, who is also in our team, is going to be giving a talk in a little bit about interoperability, which is like how we make blockchain networks talk to each other. Um, but today, Nick and I are going to be talking about some work we've been doing as a side project, which is providing support for the programming language Haskell to write smart contracts in Hyperledger Fabric. Uh, so we'll, I'll just be giving a brief overview to Hyperledger Fabric to begin with, including the smart contract modeling languages that they use. Um, and then I'll pass over to Nick, who will talk about the motivation behind why we wanted to be able to provide support for Haskell, as well as where we are with that project at the moment. Uh, so as Ewan mentioned at the very opening of tonight, Hyperledger is a permissioned blockchain system uh, platform that falls under the Hyperledger project, which is this open source community for blockchains that's run by the Linux Foundation. So Fabric was designed purposely for businesses. So it's an enter enterprise grade distributed ledger technology. Um, and it's one that IBM has contributed heavily to over the past few years. So it's not owned by any one organization. It's open source, it's community driven but it's, it's a platform that IBM has particular interest in. And we, IBM, when it develops uh, solutions for clients, uh, they generally do use Fabric. So things like Trade Lens or Food Trust or WeTrade or Lycon, these are all built on Fabric. Um, so this is a very high level overview of the Fabric architecture. Uh, it consists of a network of peer nodes and these peer nodes are run by the members of the network. So they might be run by the banks or a commercial real estate company or a shipping company. Um, and these networks are interacted with from clients. So clients will submit transactions to these peers and the peers will forward these transactions onto the chain code. And the chain code is what smart contracts are called in Fabric. And I'll We'll be using chain code and smart contract interchangeably throughout this talk. But the chain code is where the, the core business logic is held. It's the rules that govern how state is updated in the ledger. So as transactions come through from the peer to the chain code, each one of these uh, peers will execute this chain code, execute this smart contract, to determine if that transaction is valid or not. And if it is, um, 
the response will be sent back to the client who will collect all of the responses, forward it onto the ordering service, which is a service that provides consensus on the total order of these transactions. And then it will be forwarded back to the PR and then will ultimately result in updates to the ledger. But it's this chain code peer relationship that we're most interested in because the chain code is where the logic of how the ledger is updated, it's where that's held. And so we believe it's the most important part of this network. Um, so we hear quite often that one of the main selling points of blockchain is that it is an immutable ledger and it's a trusted single source of truth. And blockchain networks that we see today generally have hold quite high value assets. So it could be things like bank guarantees or stocks on a stock exchange um, or consignments in a trade logistics network. Um, and we can only get trust in these ledgers if you can trust the smart contracts because the smart contracts dictate which transactions are valid and therefore which ones will ultimately appear on the ledger. So to trust a smart contract and to trust the ledger, you need to trust that the code that is written is correct. So we kind of think about this like Gandalf. Gandalf is like the gatekeeper. All the transactions pass through Gandalf and he determines which ones pass through and ultimately end up on the ledger. Um, so in Fabric, there are currently three that are supported to write chain code. Um, they're Golang, JavaScript, and Java. These are imperative and object-oriented languages, and they were chosen because they're general purpose. So there's a, a large community out there for all three of these languages, and it means that it attracts a lot of developers to be able to get started writing chain code straight away. Um, but we believe that there's a downside to using languages like this. Um, and so we wanted to provide support for a functional language like Haskell. And I'll pass over to Nick to discuss why and how. Yeah. Thanks for that, Alison. Um, yeah, so I'll get right into it. The motivation for why we started the side project of ours. Um, and to do that first, I'm going to talk about um, at least in our opinion, what the current the problems with the current smart contract languages are that Alison just mentioned. Um, so they don't really require give us that same level of trust, and that the main reason for that is because being general purpose imperative languages, um, they're prone to bugs and exploits, um, and therefore not quite well suited for critical systems. And when I say the term critical system. Um, that generally means any kind of system that is like more vital for code to be correct. So it can include like um, software on airplanes and things like that, aviation software, and also blockchains also accounted in that because the high value assets that they can contain. Um, and some examples of um, this, um, you may be familiar with some of the more famous ones, the DAO attack and the parity attack, um, are just two examples of where um, bugs and exploits in general purpose imperative languages have caused lots of loss of money um, in these two cases on Ethereum, um, but it's a general problem where um, critical code and critical systems shouldn't be relying on general purpose imperative languages. Um, like I said at the bottom here, the cost of these bugs and exploits um, can be very high and not acceptable in many DLT use cases, and especially in enterprise use cases like the ones that Hyperledger Fabric caters for. Um, so that's kind of our, our reasoning and justification for the problems of the current languages. Um, and that leads me to, well, how do we do this better? Um, and so like Alison said, the smart contracts are like Gandalf, um, which um, determine what can be written to the ledger and not. And those smart contracts are essentially code, and that's the code that needs to be correct. So how do we achieve that code? Do we, oh, sorry, how do we achieve correct code in that? Um, static typing um, in the world of software engineering um, is by far the most successful verification technology in use today. Um, there is another one, formal verification, which I'll touch on as well, um, but static typing is the main tool that engineers use to make sure code is correct. 
Um, and there is a trade-off with that. Um, we're not saying that's always best to do. Um, for um, when it's not a critical system, sometimes the trade-off of quicker development time or something like that and not having a stronger type system may be beneficial. But again, blockchains we are considered critical systems. So we believe in that case, um, that trade-off should not be made. Um, so at the bottom here, I have this spectrum of confidence, which from left to right is just showing how these different techniques and different type systems can give you more confidence that the code is correct. Um, so on the far left, we have programming languages that have no types, and they include things like JavaScript and Python and so on. Simple types, um, so Solidity is the programming language used in Ethereum, which would be categorized under a simple type system. And then Go and Java, the other two currently spotted languages, also fit under there. Um, but then higher up on the spectrum of confidence, you have um, languages with strong type systems, like Haskell and Scala and F Sharp, for example. Um, on the next slide, I'll touch briefly on what I mean by a strong type system, but that could be a whole hour talk in itself, so I won't be able to go into too much detail. Um, but then on top of that, there's formal verification, which is not to do with static typing, but it, I just wanted to add this in here for completeness because on when we talk about a scale of confidence, formal verification is the most confidence you can have the code is correct which is ultimately one of the goals of why we started this side project. Um, as you'll see when we talk about where we're currently at, we're not there yet, but we do hope to be also doing formal verification of our code in the future. Um, so with that in mind, so why another small, smart contract language? Hopefully from those previous slides, it gave you a bit of an idea, but trusting a ledger um, is directly related to trusting smart contracts. And trusting smart contracts means you're trusting the code that wrote those contracts. Um, and therefore, it's important for those contracts to be correct. Um, and languages with strong type systems are pretty much strictly always functional programming languages. Um, and this is the bit that um, if I had an hour, I would go into more detail. But things like algebraic data types and higher kinded types and all the kind of things that come from the Lambda calculus that make up a functional programming languages make up a functional programming language, sorry, um, is what makes it a strong type system. Um, yeah, um, yeah, that's all I'll go into that for now. But um, if you're interested in that, like strong type system is the official term for it. And be, there's a Wikipedia page and things about what a strong type system means. Um, but yeah, therefore, um, the current state of the art to ensure code correctness is with a combination of functional programming and formal verification. Um, and we believe that the ability to have confidence in these smart contracts is worth creating a new smart contract language for, um, once again, because um, blockchains are critical systems and this is important. Um, so that's the motivation. Hopefully that convinced at least some of you that um, this is something, an interesting and important area to um, investigate. Um, and that leads me to our actual work. So this is just the name of our project. Um, but yeah, so with our current work, why did we pick Haskell um, specifically out of all the other choices? There's other languages that have strong type systems too. Um, so generally, um, formal verification, like I mentioned before, um, is the most effective way to guarantee correctness. Um, and the, the actual language you choose plays a key role in that as well. Um, the reason for that, functional programming provides um, a perfect foundation for applying formal verification methods um, due to both formal verification and functional programming um, having their shared roots in mathematics and due to the purity of functional programming makes it easier as well. Um, and why Haskell over another language, functional programming language? Mainly just because it's the purest mainstream functional programming language, which means um, like a larger community and better support. Um, it's basically why we picked that over the other functional programming languages. Um, and then also, in addition to it being good for formal verification, Haskell itself, like I mentioned, has a strong type system, which alone, even without formal verification, provides a higher base level of code confidence over languages with simple type systems. Um, yeah, so that's the last of that preamble. Um, now, this is just an example of a um, 
So this is in Go, and I'll show an example using our library that we've written and how the same function would look in Haskell. Um, this is, I'm obviously not gonna go into too much detail. This is more just to give a flavor of um, what it would look like in Haskell and also to show, um, you know, also, I guess also that it works. <laughs> um, but yeah, so this init marble function, this is just an example repository that Hyperledger Fabric has provided that is um, meant to just illustrate some basic usage of consuming fabric. And this is a marble example where the marble is an example asset um, instead of you know a stock or something else. And this specific function is just let you initialize a marble, which is creating a new asset and storing it on the ledger. Um, and this is what it looks like in Go. Once again, I won't go into a lot of detail, but it's just for a simple comparison. Um, and this is what it looks like in Haskell. Um, I guess the important thing here, some of the reasons why we have increased correctness here, um, because of the, the type system and the purity, um, the line one up there telling you the, the output, um, being enforced to be a pure function means that you can infer things about um, the operations of this function outside of its own context without worrying about side effects. Um, and also that implies that the function itself is one big expression. Um, yeah, um, without, I mean, obviously I'm not gonna teach you all Haskell right now, but this is just to get a flavor for um, one, our project works, and this is code that actually runs and works, and two, just to give you a quick taste of what it looks like. Um, and with that, um, it's open source. It's currently in the Hyperledger Labs organization, which is a incubator for Hyperledger projects. Um, and yeah, so it's currently there in open source. The link is at the bottom. Feel free to check it out if any of you are interested to see what the code actually looks like. Um, but aside from that, that's our whirlwind tour of our project. Um, and I'll just conclude. Um, Essentially, so we've said this a few times now, but trust in blockchain depends on trusting the smart contracts um, and therefore they must be correct. Formal verification is the state of the art for doing so and functional programming provides a good foundation for, for doing that. Um, and we've implemented support for Haskell chain code as a first step towards being able to write chain code in Hyperledger Fabric that is formally verifiable. Um, and with that, um, if there's only one thing to take away from this, like our point of view about this and why we started the side project to begin with is that smart contracts are important and therefore they need to be correct. Um, and that's our talk. Um, I'll just close out, uh, how do I get back to see if this, well, yeah. Okay. Thanks so much for that guys. I really appreciate it. There's a couple of questions that we've had in the chat um, aimed at you. First one was from Reno, can hyperledger ledger fabric uh, combined with a MERN stack. Um, do you know what a MERN stack is? It, Monzo it, Express. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's it's a React. Google <laughs> Express React. Yeah, I'm not no. sure what that is. <laughs> no. So really yeah. a JavaScript. Oh, it's yeah. a JavaScript stack. Okay. No, um, <laughs> okay, sure. Um, well, yeah, so um, like Alison mentioned, JavaScript is one of the supported languages for Hyperledger Fabric currently. And that means you can, um, there's a, an SDK for JavaScript to interact and communicate with the ledger. So yeah, applica client applications can be written in JavaScript to interact with a ledger, yes. Um, yeah, we have some code samples on developer.ivm.com. There's one that uses Postgres, but you can swap it out. Yeah, I mean, I guess the the idea behind a blockchain is that it's kind of it's kind of its own uh, database as well. That's where uh, you know you store all of your assets and things. But having said that, most blockchain networks do also come with an off-chain database, which is something that Harris touched on earlier. Hmm. So I mean, there's no reason why you couldn't use Mongo for that. And you know, blockchains also need an application client to interact with them. They need a user interface. There's no reason why you couldn't use Express and React and Node. Yeah. I um, just want to say too, like I've written, I've written things in many, many, many languages and special mention and massive kudos for like working with Haskell all the time. 
it's a heavy language. I'm just gonna say. <laughs> I mean, for us, it was the like we used it as a learning experience as well to learn Haskell ourselves because we wanted to. Um, but yeah, there's, there's definitely a bit of a learning curve getting started with it for sure. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> uh, so Jason has a couple of questions as well. Uh, he wants to know if this side project I am assuming is aiming at creating something like Solidity in Ethereum. Um, I yeah, I guess so. Yeah, I mean, Solidity is like the smart contract language of Ethereum. So I guess I get. I mean, we are using in this case, you know, it's Haskell. It's not. It's not like a dialect of Haskell. It, it's just Haskell. Um, yeah, but you know, it would enable developers the same way that they write smart contracts in Solidity for Ethereum. They developers could write smart contracts in Haskell for Fabric. Awesome. Um, and last question from Jason as well. I think the operational procedures on a fabric network, for example, adding channels, upgrade chain codes, should be done through the SDK on a web application or on the back end itself on it on the terminal of a PMO. I guess they're asking which one it should be done on. <laughs> um, the, yeah. Um, so this isn't that it's not related to the chain code aspect of fabric at all. Um, Fabric does have an SDK which enables you to interact with with the, the peers and everything. You can do it either way. So mm -hmm. I believe that IBP, IBM Blockchain Platform, has a you know a graphic user interface where you can do all of those things like join a network, uh, in, install and instantiate chain code and things like that. But you can also do that through the SDK. But those SDKs are written. There's a Node, there's a Java, I believe there's a Go one as well. Um, but we are not, at this stage at least, intending on writing a similar SDK for Haskell. We are just working at the moment on providing a stub for being able to write chain code in Haskell. The rest of the Fabric ecosystem will come later. Last yeah. question. Have you got something to find Santoshi? No, I'm not going to ask that. Anyway, I'm basically talking. <laughs> <laughs> Side project too. That one's a secret, though. <laughs> secret function. Uh, thank you, thank you so much for sharing that with us, uh, Alison and Nick. It's always great talking to you. Uh, mostly just because you have an awesome name and you're also an awesome person. So. <laughs> uh, you too, Nick. You're all right. <laughs> I, I think you're talking about me. <laughs> you already did that. <laughs> <laughs> Again, uh, big thanks for joining us. Uh, they'll be around at the end of this, guys, so please um, have a chat to them about any other uh, questions you might have. Um, otherwise, uh, big thank you, and I want to welcome up uh, a fellow IBM researcher, um, Yas Abebe. Um, I'm, I really hope I said that right as well. Apologies if not. Um, so I've heard a lot about you, uh, um, yes, from your peers, uh, from another peer at uh, Blockchain Research as well, I think, Aharon, or Aaron, sorry, his name is. Um, so I'm really looking forward to hearing uh, about your blockchain interoperability uh, chat. Uh, so without further ado, um, welcome to the stage. Thanks, Ali. I, I assume you can hear me all right? Hearing you loud and clear as well, thanks. Perfect, okay. So, hello, my name is Aramis Abibi. I'm a senior research scientist at our Melbourne Research Lab, and I lead the blockchain uh, strategy for our lab. What I'd like to do over the next few minutes or so is give you a high-level overview of a topic that my team and I are fairly passionate about, which is blockchain interoperability. And a quick outline of you know, how, how we'd kind of approach this topic I want to start off by you know, starting to motivate what blockchain interoperability is. It's somewhat a bit of an overloaded term, so I'll probably spend a little bit of time motivating why it matters, what exactly we mean by blockchain interoperability. And with that background, I'll try and clarify the specific challenges, technical challenges the blockchain interoperability tries to address. Then I'll give you a sense of the different modes of interoperability. And what I mean by that is really when we talk about different networks talking to each other, what are the various interactions we're thinking of? Using that, I'll give you a sense of the various efforts and projects that are emerging in the space. 
starting off with you know a subset of protocols that really focus on a sub problem in interoperability, which is asset exchange and transfer. And then I will talk about the broad architectures and projects that we're seeing that try to under, to try to solve the broad problem of blockchain interoperability as a whole, right? So not just asset exchange, but data transfer, complex state orchestration, and so on. And then I'll end by giving you an overview of a protocol that we, that my team, uh, uh, in collaboration with other labs and research, have been building over the past year and a half that attempts to do general interoperability across permission networks. And we're hoping to open source this project over the next couple of months. So this is somewhat timely to kind of give you a bit of a sense of, of what that looks like. Okay, so to really understand why blockchain interoperability matters, I think we probably need to take a little bit of a step back and you know, frame the landscape as it's evolved over the past decade or so from two dimensions. You know, the first dimension being the technology dimension, which is <clears throat> over the past 10 years, what we've seen is different technologies and protocols, blockchain protocols emerging with based on different design philosophies and abstractions and implementation. And we've seen a lot of experimentation and interesting ideas that have emerged from that process. But the end result is that we have essentially a proliferation of different blockchain protocols, hundreds of different blockchain protocols, most of which are not really compatible or designed with how they, with how they might work together in mind. Right? So we've got this fragmentation of technology with you know, somewhat heterogeneous technical stack with different choices around you know, the core abstractions that they're built around, built around and the design philosophies that govern them. So we have a technology landscape that is somewhat quite heterogeneous, quite fragmented. On the other side, it's interesting to look at how businesses have been experimenting with blockchain technology and adopting it over the past half a decade or so, at least in the permission space. And there, we noticed that for practical reasons, similar to what you know, you've know you heard over the last hour or so, most businesses have been adopting blockchain by focusing on very specific niche use cases, right? It's a lot more tractable and achievable to do that. So for, for instance, if you take the Ligon example, what we're trying to do there was specifically digitize one financial instrument. But the reality of business is that it's a lot more complex. Even though adoption of blockchain makes sense to do on a use case basis where we build entire blockchain networks and solutions on top of them that address specific use cases, the end-to-end -end process often involves a number of different steps that need to link together and work with each other. A simple example could be to look at Ligon itself. The whole process, instrument of a bank guarantee behind the scenes is securing another legal contract that might exist, for instance, a commercial lease agreement, right? When it requires parties that have KYC, it requires payment in the event of a default. However, today we've kind of been building very different networks for each of these. We have KYC networks that we've been building. We have legal contracting networks that we've been building. And we have a proliferation of uh, payments networks that we've been building. The, in order to really have an end-to-end -end business process that works seamlessly together, we now have a requirement where we need all of these different use cases and solutions that are built on blockchain networks to seamlessly exchange data and value amongst themselves and orchestrate complex business processes. Right. So these two dimensions, from a technology perspective, you see that we have a lot of heterogeneity and fragmentation of different technologies that have emerged with hundreds of different protocols that have emerged over the past decade. And in the adoption side, we see a lot of different solutions and networks that have emerged that need to talk to each other, but are somewhat impeded by the fragmentation of technology underneath them. So, you know, a very simple way to kind of illustrate what I said earlier is to just look at, you know, the various networks that you might have heard about. You, you probably have heard of a, a number of examples, example networks around KYC, including one that, uh, you know, our team built with a number of multinational banks out of Singapore, a uh, number of payments networks and guarantee networks like, like Ligon and logistics networks like TradeLens and so on. 
And all of these today are independent networks that somewhat exist as silos on their own. And this whole idea of blockchain interoperability is to, at a very high level, move into a future in which all of these networks can share information and interact, interact with each other in a manner that preserves the core security properties that you take for granted in each of these networks independently. So, as I mentioned, essentially what we want to do is have seamless flow of data and value between these networks. The advantages of doing this are somewhat clear. Obviously, we're removing data and value silos that are being trapped in each of these networks today. We're able to orchestrate complex business processes and in a sense, digitize end-to-end -end business processes as opposed to niche use cases in isolation. We're able to improve network effects, increase market size and overall efficiency. Networks are better able to scale and grow. And all of these we think would be somewhat critical for the next step of this technology, for the further adoption of this technology. Right? So that's why we think blockchain interoperability matters. Um, before we proceed further, it's, it's worth trying to scope the problem of blockchain interoperability because it's somewhat a bit overloaded. And one way to do that might be to have a bit more of a layered view of what we mean, right? Obviously, interoperability is not just a technology concern. There are a number of things that need to come together in order to build a blockchain solution, like, like, like Harris mentioned earlier. And, you know, at, at the higher most level, you can think of things like legal and regulatory um, harmonization that needs to happen across different jurisdictions. Is this electronic bill of lading acceptable in this jurisdiction and that jurisdiction? Things that need to be in place in order to facilitate international trade, right? Um, you can imagine a number of efforts and standards that are happening around governance and, uh, governance and policies, around domain standards. All of these are standardization efforts that are focused on different things that need to be in place as, as enablers to get networks to talk to each other, to net, get networks and solutions to understand each other as they communicate. The layer we're more interested in in this talk is the layer underneath, which is essentially the technology concerns that facilitate the interaction of blockchain networks and the semantics of that interaction that also preserves the core properties of blockchain networks themselves, right? There are certain things we take for granted that we try to have essentially deploy blockchain networks for. How can we preserve those properties as we're interacting across different networks, right? And so the semantic layer, the syntactic layer, and the technical layer that I have underneath is really what we're going to try and focus on uh, over the next few minutes. So, an obvious question you might be thinking is, you know, what, what's somewhat unique about this problem of interoperability? We've been integrating systems for decades. Um, you know, what, what's new? Um, one, one key difference that is somewhat essential to, to, to grasp is when you move into the world of blockchain, you're moving away from a model in which you rely on single party trust and into a model where you have essentially multi-party trust and you're relying on multiple parties. What I mean by that is if you look at these two diagrams on the, on the left, whenever you're, you're essentially one web service querying another web service, let's say you're getting stock data from Thomson Reuters, you are trusting Thomson Reuters, right? There's a known trusted party that is essentially going to be the source of that data. The same applies if your blockchain network querying a known trusted party, like what you see at the bottom left, right? If an entire blockchain network wants to use an Oracle, a trusted Oracle for some data, like a stock price, like I mentioned, then there isn't much of a problem there. There's a known single party that, you can, that everyone trusts. The problem emerges when you move into this, this kind of model, where you either have some existing system of record, let's say, that needs to query a blockchain network, or one blockchain network that needs to query and interact with another blockchain network. Because you're moving into a model where the authority on state is not really a single party, but rather a collective or a group of parties and the consensus rules and policies that they have in place to govern the integrity of state. So anyone that's querying and interacting with the blockchain network needs to be able to establish that some state is true 
according to the consensus rules of, of, of that state. Right? And this is a fundamental difference that you know kind of causes a number of other considerations to emerge. So which leads us you know to what I mentioned earlier, which is uh, you know proofs and verification. So every time you kind of query state from a blockchain network, you need to establish that it's valid according to the consensus rules. Another consideration is this notion of you know, the difference between data and assets. Assets have certain properties you can't double spend and a number of other things you need to consider with, with assets that you also need to preserve in the context of interacting with other networks, right? So th these two things to keep in mind. So within that frame, you know, this is, this is one way to look at um, you know, a, a more layered view of the various technical things to consider when we're talking about blockchain and interoperability, right? So here, what you see is essentially a, layer, a conceptual layered stack of uh, a technical stack where you, underneath you have the DLT protocol and the network layer, ledger, and smart contracts on top, right? So when we talk about interoperability, it could, it means everything from a scenario in which smart contracts on the same network need to interact with each other, all the way in scenarios in which smart contracts across different networks based on different DLTs need to be able to interact with each other, right? And it also, of course, includes scenarios where blockchain networks need to in interact with existing systems of record. Now, a thing to note here on the side, which is quite important, is that every layer of difference you have between any two smart contracts that are interacting introduces additional thought, uh, considerations because of heterogeneity at a specific layer, right? So you might be talking to a network that has instant finality compared to something that has a probabilistic finality, and that raises a whole set of other considerations. You'll be interacting with networks that have different ledger models and so on, right? So every layer of heterogeneity introduced in this interaction adds a number of other co uh, concerns and considerations. Okay, so that gives us a view of the spectrum that, that we essentially need to consider when we talk about blockchain interoperability. Now, what exactly is being interacted, right? So here's a simple view to look at, you know, the modes of interoperation. Um, quite simply, you might have a scenario where you have asset exchange, right, which is to say, for instance, you know, I give you a certain number of, um, you know, one Bitcoin on one network for a certain number of Litecoin on another, another network, right? We're coordinating a trans transaction across two networks, right? We're essentially doing a swap of assets, right? I'm giving you some assets uh, on this network for whatever we deem is a corresponding amount in another network. The other scenario is an asset transfer, where you might essentially have an asset that is moving from one network into a completely different network. It could be that you're burning it on this network or you know, essentially kind of exiting it from this network, if you will, and, and issuing it on another network. Or it could be that you're locking it on one network and issuing it on another. And there are a few instances in the, in the permissionless space where uh, people use that. And then there's the more broader scenario, which is around data transfer, right? especially in the permission context, uh, so like some of the examples you heard Harris cite, we essentially have this broad requirement of uh, data that is being stored on blockchain networks. So how we're able to essentially communicate that data across networks with guarantees of validity of that data, uh, according to the consensus rules of, of the network that it, it comes from, is going to be essential, right? So these are essentially the modes of interoperation. Okay, so... The, in order to look at the different projects that have emerged in the space, uh, it's worth classifying it into two parts. One is more focused niche protocols that are focused on really asset exchange and transfer. And you can imagine why there have been you know, an emergence of quite a few of these protocols, right? In the permissionless space, you have quite a lot of cryptocurrencies and you need to be able to do these exchanges without necessarily being mediated by centralized exchange. So quite a lot of protocols have emerged to address that problem. And so there, these are very focused problems that don't address everything about interoperability, but try to address really one of these uh, scenarios of uh, asset exchange or transfer. I'm not going to go into the specific protocols themselves, but I'll give you an idea of the pattern that they generally follow. 
So, you know, when you're doing asset exchange, like we mentioned earlier, essentially what you're trying to do is coordinate a, a transfer of, of an exchange of assets on one network with a corresponding swap of an asset in another network, right? And you can imagine there are a number of properties you want to preserve when doing that, right? It needs to be atomic, for instance, right? It wouldn't be acceptable that I send you my Bitcoin and I never get a corresponding Litecoins on another network as an example, right? It has to be atomic. Either it succeeds or uh, uh, it fails. I either both go through or, or, or none of it does. It needs to be, you know, it needs to guarantee liveness, right? So essentially at any point in time, it shouldn't be the case that I lock my funds forever. That wouldn't be desirable. And of course, you have this broad idea of fairness, right? Can we do this in a timely manner? Can we do that? This exchange ends up being fair for both of us. And by fair, I don't really mean the exchange rate of something. I just mean that it's never really a scenario where I lock my funds for two days and you know, you you essentially don't lock your funds for some time, and you know what I mean. So that gives you a certain arbitrage opportunity and so on. It's right? so a degree of fairness. And associated with that, of course, there are a number of other desired properties that such protocols try to maintain, right? And some of these will matter in some use cases, and others will in, in, in others, right? So things like throughput and latency, uh, the ability to, to essentially have auditability, right? So you can imagine for regulatory reasons or anti-money laundering and a number of other uh, considerations, you need to be able to audit transfers that are happening across different networks, as an example. And of course, cost, right? So cost might be associated to, to what you're doing, whether it's uh, you know mining fees and so on. And um, essentially, that it could be a consideration as well. So the broad pattern that some of these ex exchange protocols follow looks something like this. On the top left, you kind of you see the most simple example, which is you have a trusted intermediary that essentially mediates the exchange between these. Right? It's not quite interesting, but obviously the most obvious case. If you and I need to exchange some assets across two networks, and there's an entity we know and trust that resides across both networks can essentially allow that entity to mediate this exchange. The other one that tries to decentralize it that a bit more is what you see on the top right, which is instead of a single party, you have a group of parties, some trusted federation that will be responsible for mediating this. And there are a number of protocols that have different variations on this, you know, some of them they require a trusted federation, others try to have the trusted federation put in some collateral and so on, right? So different variations to this. And at the bottom, what you see is perhaps a bit more of the most decentralized approach in doing this, which is that parties essentially encode contracts on their respective networks to be able to coordinate their this exchange amongst themselves. And this is a well-known pattern called, you know, the, the hash time lock contracts, and there are numerous variations to, to uh, this, this protocol. In the interest of time, I, I won't delve into this in any meaningful detail. Basically, here what I'm trying to show you is the last pattern that I mentioned, which is hash time lock contracts. Essentially, the idea is Alice and Bob want to exchange assets in across two networks, which is Alice sends Bob some network uh, some assets in network A, and Bob sends a corresponding set of assets to, to Alice on network B. And what they do is they essentially encode, uh, lock their funds um, on the corresponding networks that are released on the condition of some revelation of some secret, right? And one of these parties ends up knowing that secret, but the act of trying to claim their assets on one network will reveal the, the secret to the corresponding counterparty, which can then use that to, to essentially claim a corresponding uh, asset from another network. The idea being, the, the intuition behind this is that you're trying to coordinate asset exchange by encoding the rules of the exchange across networks and some secret that essentially will unlock the funds across both networks when, when submitted by parties. So if, if folks are interested, we can discuss about this uh, afterwards. So we briefly covered patterns of asset exchange. Now, the more interesting um, uh, set of uh, projects are those that try to address the general problem of interoperability, right? 
Interoperability, as we saw, is not just about assets, but the broad data transfer and state orchestration problem as well, right? So there are different architectures that have emerged uh, to address this problem. The most obvious, which is really not interoperability, but worth mentioning anyway, is a scenario where you have a convergence into a single network, right? So if you're an Ethereum maximalist, you might think this is the future. But the general idea being that, you know, in one general purpose network like Ethereum or Cardano or Tezos or a fabric mainnet, um, you might have different applications and smart contracts deployed that, it, that talk to each other. This is a much simplified version of the problem, essentially because you have the same technology and all you need to care is about domain uh, level standards and so on. But you know, this is somewhat optimistic. Uh, convergence into a single network is likely not to, going to be the case because there are different technologies and different designs for different use cases. So the more interesting set of patterns around really trying to address interoperability um, look something like this. Um, one of the, uh, the, the more prominent ones is where you have a blockchain in between blockchains that want to interact with each other, right? And this primary network that is essentially the hub, think of this as a hub and spoke model, the hub that tries to coordinate the interaction of different um, child networks can play different roles. Some of it could be to offer security guarantees, some of it to just could be to just be um, essentially uh, to, to shuttle messages across these networks. And there are different projects that employ different levels of guarantees and responsibility to this primary network. It's an interesting model. It's a model that you'll see and uh, that across some of the more prominent projects in the permissionless space, like Polkadot and Cosmos. But um, it, it comes up with a number of constraints, right? So child networks have to adhere to the protocol of the primary network to a large extent. And there are privacy and confidentiality constraints that oftentimes would limit uh, the applicability of such a pattern in the case of permission blockchains. The last and most desire desirable model would be something like this where you have independent networks that are able to make independent technology decisions and governing choices, but are still able to communicate by communicating state about the, that resides on their ledger with some independently verifiable proof, right? It's certainly a more difficult pattern to try and um, achieve, but it's one that from our perspective, we've been uh, focused on from our protocol. Um, so a quick snapshot of all of you know quite some of the uh, prominent projects on interoperability, and I, I didn't go into any of these projects, but rather gave you a feel of the the broad architecture that they they seem to follow. Okay, cool. So we took a quick uh, glance at you know the various efforts and projects that are trying to address the space. And what I'd like to do over the next few minutes is give you a quick sense of the protocol that we've been building uh, to address blockchain interoperability, uh, for primarily focused on permission blockchains, right? Which mean Fabric, and Corda, and permissioned Ethereum. And a way to understand this protocol that we've built could be to start with you know, the design principles that have kind of guided our thinking. And, the first one is somewhat quite obvious, you know, given we have different variations and different DLT protocols that have emerged, the protocol that we come up with has to, as much as possible, be DLT agnostic, right? We don't know what will emerge tomorrow, and we don't want to kind of build a protocol that is, you know, heavily leaning towards any specific protocol that exists today. As much as possible, we want to base a protocol that relies on the most common cryptographic primitives that that uh, all different DLTs share. Right? The second one is independence. Different networks will have their own governance decisions, their own technology choices. So enabling networks to maintain that independence is going to be a key aspect of trying to get a protocol that will really get traction and adoption, especially in the permission space. The other three are somewhat also quite obvious, right? Which is we want to minimize any dependence or trust assumption that we make on, any, on some third party. 
And of course, privacy and confidentiality is, is critical in permission space. So we have to make sure that this protocol doesn't reveal any anything to any intermediaries within an interaction beyond anyone that needs to know, right? So these were some of our anchoring uh, design principles as we thought about uh, a protocol. So the pattern, you know, linking this back to the architectural pattern, the ar architectures, I, I, uh, the patterns that I showed you earlier, what we're trying to do is really something that looks a little bit more like this, right? Where we have two key elements for to this protocol. One is the notion of state that resides on the ledger and the ability to create independently verifiable proofs about the validity of a state, right? And by state, I mean data and assets and so on. And then a set of components that allow you to relay or shuttle messages, which is state and proofs, across different networks, right? So these are the two foundational uh, components to think about, or abstractions actually to think about, right, in our protocol. The ability to, to essentially have state and independently verifiable proofs of that state, and a mechanism to essentially allow you to route this in a, in a manner that doesn't assume intermediate, intermediaries and trusted parties. At a high level, this is what our protocol would look like. Um, you know, it, it gives you a sense of the different relays that would essentially interface networks and an ability for these relays, which talk a common protocol, to exchange state and proofs about state and coordinate complex orchestration of uh, of state changes across different networks. In the interest of time, I, I don't think I'll delve into the architecture of the relay itself, but this is designed in such a manner that allows us to evolve this to do complex you know, verification of, of correctness on, on the protocol itself um, and a range of other things that we have to consider you know, as we think about this, the usage of such a, a, a component across different um, permissioned uh, enterprise networks. As you can imagine, the protocol has multiple pieces, not just the relay, but you know, a set of deployable smart contracts and changes to an SDK that would make it a lot easier for developers to author cross-network applications and orchestrate you know, complex business logic, for instance, across different networks that might require asset exchange on one end and then you know, some state change on another network and so on and link these together you know, comp good abstractions for developers to be able to orchestrate this. And this notion of network drivers, which, uh, you know, I had in the earlier slide, which is a way to kind of make sure that this protocol is extensible to different DL2 protocols as we, as we go along. Um, for anyone that's interested, you know, we'd be happy to give you a bit of a demo on this at some point, uh, but basically uh, we, uh, uh, you know, builds a demo that essentially kind of is inspired by our flagship project, which is Trade Lens and uh, um, and Retrade, and how we might be able to orchestrate, you know, um, complex end-to-end -end process of shipping goods and securing trade finance and so on across three networks, right? Um, a fabric network, which does trade logistics, and two trade finance networks, one built on Accorda and one built on fabric. So this protocol in the demo is something we plan to open source in uh, before the end of the year. Um, so do you stay stay tuned to this to this bit? Um, I might end here in the interest of time and see if if there are any questions. Oh, so amazing. Thank you so much. Um, <laughs> we're well, going to have to get you back when the demo is ready uh, to display. I think I, we'd all love to see that, to be honest. Uh, actually, there's no questions in the chat, I don't think, but feel free to ask them now if anyone is um, sitting on one. Uh, I do what, have one for you, though. Hmm. I want to... I want to ask in about 20 years, which industry or I, do you think this is going to revolutionize the most? Which one do you think blockchain is really going to, you're going to look back at it and go, I don't recognize this industry anymore. It's completely different or that you're excited about changing. And feel free to say all of them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I think, you know, um, as, as a foundational infrastructure, I think it will disrupt a number of different industries. I think financial services as a sector will probably see the biggest disruption, right? And this this could be, you know, 
not just from the perspective of you know um, all of the different cryptocurrencies and payments networks that are emerging, but if you look at the traditional financial services uh, sector itself, I think there's a significant amount of digitization that can happen in that in that sector that would really benefit from such an infrastructure. And you know, Ligon is one example, but there are numerous examples around trade finance and a number of other uh, you know capital markets and so on that will really kind of benefit from this. And so, you know, 20 years is quite a big uh, time horizon, but say in about a decade out, I'd look at financial services today and, and I'd say that, you know, that would probably be an industry that would see uh, a significant, significant transformation. Oh, and I should also mention CBDCs, which, which are coming, which I think will be really, really interesting. Uh, central bank digital currencies. Amazing. Yeah, that will be really interesting to watch, actually, I think. Right. Right. <laughs> That's one of the things I love most about blockchain is you just never know, like, where where it's popping up. And even, like, more and more mm -hmm. um, um, these days, like, you, you're seeing all sorts of stuff come out, especially out of the government's new um, sort of roadmap mm -hmm. that they're putting together now, like, looking to see how it can. In fact, while, while you were talking, which is amazing talk, um, I was rummaging around the field behind me and uh, just... Mm -hmm happened to find like the crypto is only up to the floor. Uh, like well nice. we're, 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 uh, we're just gonna <laughs> nice <laughs> uh, that isn't real can you pass it through to me if you don't mind um no <laughs> uh, a couple more questions have popped up in the chat just like steep bitcoin there um one from Mariana. uh what could be the limitations for a faster adoption of blockchains that's a good question yeah, that's a good question. Um, you know, uh, somewhat linking it back to this talk, I think blockchain interoperability will certainly be one of those, right? Um, there will be a number of others around, you know, scalability and, and throughput and so on, right? So to get to certain use cases uh, that we want to transform, I think addressing quite a bit of the scalability issue and will obviously be important. But I think... Um, Blockchain interoperability will certainly be one of those, right? Um, we've seen an interesting period of experimentation, but now quite a lot of the networks that we've seen are maturing and going into production. And all of a sudden we're kind of realizing, oh, these networks really need to integrate into existing systems of record. They need to be able to interoperate and talk to each other. And that can, um, you know, potentially kind of in, uh, slow down adoption and, and growth and maturity, unless we're somewhat able to kind of get, get ahead of that, and you know, through protocols like, uh, you know, what we briefly discussed over the past few minutes and try to address those issues. But uh, yeah, so interoperability is one, scalability, throughput are, are obvious ones as well. Amazing. Um, and a last question, which has got heaps of votes from a really well-named guy called Nick Wayward. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <Last question. laughs> I'm kidding, Nick. Uh, do you think interoperability between blockchains will make it viable for more use cases and industries to adopt blockchain? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, um, you know, which links back to the to the earlier point as well. I think the ability to be able to have networks that can uh, more seamlessly talk to each other, I think will um, first make these networks a lot more viable and actually get them to deliver a lot more value as opposed to becoming, you know, new data and value silos and things that can't really interact with other things that they depend on, but also potentially open up uh, new business models, new use cases and ideas that you know, we haven't yet thought about, right? Because you can envision being able to orchestrate complex and complex things by weaving more networks together right and so that could open up new and new, uh, newer and newer possibilities but uh really good question Nick. <laughs> awesome sounds like it's a good question for the networking chat as well um i do have there is a couple more questions uh guys but if you don't mind asking um yes after this uh, I just want to make sure that no one's having to run to something and going to miss out on uh, their dinner or something tonight. So um, thank you again, Amias. Really appreciate okay. that. Um, I can't see you, Steve. So. <laughs> oh, really? Uh, it's um, probably my yeah. connection, though, to be honest. So um, all good. Sweet.
Can you hear Again, me or is your internet dropping? I can hear you. Yeah, massive thank you to all our speakers tonight for giving up their time and teaching us so much about uh, blockchain, where it's going, what's happening now, um, and, and just getting to know some really amazing people doing some great research in that field. Uh, pretty interesting for me as well. Um, I, we do have some upcoming events that we want to get you across. Uh, the first one is Telstra Health Hack. It, it is. It's coming up. One of the few hackathons left for the year. Um, if uh, Check it out. We'll send it and drop it everyone an email to let you all know how to sign up. But, yeah, it starts uh, next Friday night and goes through for two weekends. So it is being uh, helped being run by the good folks at Health Hack, for those that, that are familiar with that one out of Queensland, and was run early in the year all online. So um, now partnering with Telstra Health to be able to put on this event, um, some great problems which will be announced this week. Um, and yeah, totally check it out. Uh, hit me up in the networking session if you want to find out more. But like I said, we'll drop everyone an email to let you all know how to get involved. Definitely, and a really big topic at the moment that needs a lot of innovation. So yeah, uh, it's great to be a part of those. Uh, totally uh, Telstra has a whole bunch of really cool tech. Um, if you can see me right now, I'm holding up this amazing little shield stack thing, connects into CAD M1. Anyway, we, me and uh, Michelle Howie, the Telstra Dev Evangelist, have an amazing demo and workshop planned with that one as well. And of course, there will be puns. <laughs> That's why I wear this hat, Steve, when I'm around you, honestly. Don't want to hurt my, my head all the time. <laughs> it does. Um, and, we do have uh, another event coming up. Actually, we've got a few more <laughs> other events we're going to talk about. But um, this one's really cool. It's from it's in conjunction with our good friends at Here Technologies, uh, who we've got someone with us tonight. Um, hello, Sam. Uh, Sam Good. is happy for you to do it, I think, Steve. <laughs> oh, was he? I just invited yes. him to the stage. That's fine. But yeah, oh, there he is. Woo, Sam. How are you guys doing? <laughs> What's yeah, going things um, that done. That's all right. Um, workshop things. So if you've uh, got some amazing workshops lined up um, using our whole whole suite of technologies, um, yeah, you can say a few words or I can either way. Um, I'm, okay, I'm I can. Happy for you to do it. Just want to go <laughs> all right, it. that's fine. And, um, we'll edit this out later. Know. That's fine. Okay. Yeah, we've got, um, it's a, literally, <laughs> that's fine. Um, yeah, we uh, we have a series of five uh, workshops coming up uh, over five weeks, um, covering a number of different technologies, including blockchain. The last one is about blockchain and logistics and maps. So anyway, we will also email out some details about that. Um, the first one starts tomorrow. In fact, it's a busy week this week. There is many events happening. Let me just say, so many um, events lead up to Christmas here. Yeah? It's it end of year. Yeah, it's the November wrap up. Um, but yeah, the first one starts tomorrow. Um, got some really cool speakers lined up and some amazing technologies. And of course, it's all open source. Like you can grab the code, you can build some stuff out and play with it. But um, yeah, we will drop some links out after this meetup so everyone can also come check that out. Definitely. And the next one I want to get, uh, thank you, Sam, by the way. <laughs> um, and the next one I just want to quickly uh, get people across is uh, a data and AI conference that's being held on November 24th in the Asia Pacific, Australia, <laughs> reason. Uh, so uh, this is, uh, we're having hands-on workshops. You'll be able to get accredited so you can start your journey to data and AI. If that's something you're interested in, you'll get Coursera um, accreditation at the end of this. Um, and it will be on demand a bit later, I believe. But best to go to it. The Coursera credit will only be available by going on the day. Um, yeah, so yeah. much uh, to learn there. <laughs> and it's <laughs> free uh, free to attend. Um, and it starts at, see my memory's right, but 2.30 uh, p.m. AEST or 3.30 p.m. AEDT. Uh, on the twenty fourth of November. Uh, check out the. Uh, <laughs> we will send oh, that the was, link that out the, that as well. Uh, definitely. That was the ISP. Ah, uh, right. Okay. Yep. 
anyway, uh, <laughs> we'll send a link out for that. Thank you, Steve. Um, the last one, and you were just talking about your uh, Michelle Howie from Telstra Dev. We also run an Oz IoT uh, meetup alongside uh, Michelle from Telstra Dev. She's awesome. Um, and our next one is coming up on the 25th of November. And of course, the IBM developer meetup that you are all here. Thank you for joining us. Our final one will be a year in review, our highlight celebration. Um, we're going to have some panelists from the Call for Code. Uh, second place getters come up and talk about their stories as well and we'd love to hear from you as well so if anyone has some a win they'd like to share with us um, in December please get in touch and let us know and again speak a call out we'd also love to hear your ideas about what you want to hear at these meetups who you want to hear from uh, and what you want to talk about or if you have a talk that you'd like to give please get in touch with it's all from us thank you so much everyone for coming um, I guess it's time for the blockchain <laughs> Signing off. Watching <Yep>. party. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. See you at the tables. <laughs>